Well, I'm Shireen Bhan, and we're in conversation with the U.S. Ambassador to India, Richard Varma. Ambassador Varma, appreciate you joining Thank us you. here on CNBC TV 18. I'm going to start by quoting you back to you. You've said that this is a year of consequence for India and the U.S., and a year of transformation as well. What would you base your assessment on? What are the parameters that you use to judge that? When we look at all the major categories of cooperation between the U.S. and India, whether it's in the defense arena or clean energy or economics and trade or all the other categories, what we saw in, in 2015 and 2014 is that we exceeded or broke every record in mm. all of those categories. So two-way trade numbers were the highest ever. Uh, the number of visitors to the United States, the highest ever, 1.2 million. Uh, the number of students studying in the United States, the highest ever. So we've really deepened and expanded our cooperation in, in so many areas. You know, over the course of our two histories, we've pursued these independent tracks, independent economic tracks, independent security tracks. And what we've seen over the last decade, mm. but really over the last two years in particular, is that the two tracks have started to converge uh, in a way that we haven't seen before. And is that largely to do with the chemistry between President Obama and Prime Minister Modi? Look, I think that's a big part of it, and I think they both have put a lot into the relationship. The President called this one of his top foreign policy priorities. I think there's more to it than that, though. We obviously have shared values. Well, we but we had the shared values, you know, a decade ago right. as well. I think there is now an acknowledgement that we need each other. We need each other economically to help power the economic growth globally. We need each other as trading partners. We need each other from a security perspective to help stabilize parts of Asia and South Asia and to be uh, partners in counterterrorism cooperation. We need each other to bring the latest uh, solutions in clean energy and civil nuclear energy to the population mm. uh, that currently doesn't have it. We need each other uh, from a science and innovation point of view to continue to uh, be the world's best innovators. Mm. How driven is this also by the U.S.'s effort or need to rebalance the power equation in Asia? Uh, I mean, you know, there's no secret about China and the dominance that China has had uh, on the global economic front, especially when it comes to trading ties with the U.S. I think what you've seen is a convergence. We, as you say, we've had a rebalance to Asia uh, for the last three or four years now. Uh, Two-thirds of our Navy will be in, in Asia. We're shifting to where the people, the trade, and the economics is taking place in the future, and, and that's a reasonable focus for us. Uh, at the same time, India has its Act East policy. Mm. Those two uh, intersections are coming into great convergence, and we're finding cooperation across the Asia-Pacific. Who would have thought it possible that the U.S. and India would enter into a joint vision statement for the Asia-Pacific mm -hmm. where we agreed to deepen our trade and economic relationships, uh, uphold the rule of law, uh, cooperate uh, militarily and from a maritime perspective in a way that we never have before. So I think there's great intersection. What I would say mm -hmm. is that this cooperation is not directed at any third country, certainly not directed at China. Uh, you know, it's interesting. We both have very complicated uh, economic interdependence mm -hmm. with China. Uh, we have robust engagement with China. When we have security concerns with China, we talk about them. When we have human rights concerns with China, we talk about them. But uh, the U.S.-India relationship very much stands on its own. So let me ask you about specifics now on how we can engage uh, and sort of move forward and achieve the sort of targets that we've set out for ourselves. The roadmap for that $500 billion bilateral trade target, we're nowhere close to it. Uh, what do you see as, as the, the next milestone in being able to get to that number? Sure. I actually think we're closer to it than, 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 we pe think? than people would expect. The reason I say that is because Right now, only about 2% of U.S. exports come to India, mm -hmm. and only about 2% of India's exports go to the United States. Yep. So given the size of our respective economies, even if we were to increase uh, that, those numbers even uh, slightly, we would make a big dent in that two-way trade number. There is a lot of interest in India. It's not just interest. Mm. We're starting to see investment decisions taken. But, but they, are, they are watching what happens on the reform front, both in Delhi. They're watching what happens mm. at individual state levels. I think they've, they've seen a very good trajectory. Uh, and as we continue to bring down those barriers to entry, uh, and again, in both directions, then I think that number will, will increasingly head towards that $500 billion target that our president and prime minister have set. What do you think is holding back the investment decision today? Because you said, obviously, uh, 
reforms and the agenda for reforms is one thing, but the actual implementation on the ground is another. Do they continue to be concerned about the pace of change at this point in time? I think uh, there have been concerns over, over many years, and we can go through some of those indicators uh, you know, that are under the ease of doing business umbrella. You know, and I will say there has been good progress. When I look at just at the tax category, mm. for example, you know, uh, tax fairness and tax certainty was certainly one of the number one issues that kept coming up. The fact that we've entered into advanced transfer pricing mm -hmm. agreements, uh, the fact that we've settled 100 old tax cases, that there are 100 to go, the fact that the government has taken off the issue of retro, taken off the table retroactive taxation, all those help. Uh, bring the issue of, of tax fairness and tax certainty into, into better So you're saying it's no longer the number one concern, tax fairness and tax certainty is no longer the number one concern when I, it comes to U.S. investors looking at India? I'm saying uh, it's been tackled in a way that perhaps it hasn't been tackled in the past and that we're having excellent government-to-government -government conversations. And to the extent there are lingering cases and, and lingering um, you know, uh, old tax cases that need to be solved. Mm -hmm. We need to do that to get more confidence into the system. But it's not just tax. It's contract sanctity mm -hmm. and legal certainty. I think the development of commercial courts will really help in, in this regard. It's regulatory burden. Uh, again, when you look at what the states are doing, mm -hmm. let's say, for example, on a single uh, regulatory licensing window, I think that sort of reform will really help. In 2005, there were only about 200 U.S. companies mm -hmm. operating here in India. That number is well over uh, 500 companies now and employing some several million Indian workers. A big part of my job is to make sure we're attracting investment into to the United US, States yes. as well. And what we've seen there is, is dramatic as well. And we've gone from 50 Indian companies uh, a few years ago to well over 200. Since you're talking about Indians investing in the U.S., I'm sure you have had conversations with Indian IT companies who are not particularly happy at this point in time. So let me ask you to comment on that. NASCOM has put out a, a number saying that Indian IT companies would be hit with about a $400 million charge on account of the latest visa fee hikes. The totalization agreement hasn't gone anywhere, despite the fact that both sides have been trying to uh, sort of converge on, on this issue. A, is there any hope that we are going to see any progress as far as the totalization agreement is concerned? And B, on the visa hike specifically, uh, you know, is there, is there any recourse for Indian companies? For the first time in 2015, we entered into a discussion with the Indian government on totalization. Our Social Security Administration with their Indian counterparts had two really constructive meetings. Let's see where, where they can take it, but I know the president is committed to having a really uh, uh, robust dialogue on this subject. Okay. On the H-1B and L-1 visa mm -hmm. fees, I also think you know that India gets somewhat like 70 percent of all H-1B sure. visas issued. I also understand the concern about the increase in fee that went from uh, 2,000 to 4,000, 2,500 to 4,500 in the case of the L-1s. I also know that there is a, a conversation going on with members of Congress about the fee. Let's see where that goes. I think people should also know what the fee increase was for. Mm. It was in a budget bill that was a two yep. trillion dollar budget right. bill. Uh, provision that was designed to raise money for the victims' families mm -hmm. uh, from 9-11. Let me ask you about the areas of opportunity uh, specifically, and of course the Smart City Initiative of the government is something that the U.S. has said that they would like to partner with. You've identified three cities, including Ajmer and uh, Vizag, and Vizag, of course, has made it to the, the first list of the 20 right. cities that the government has approved. What what exactly do you hope to do with the Smart City Initiative? Where do you really see the U.S. private sector contributing? Uh, what kind of opportunities do you, for instance, see in developing the municipal bond market? Right. Uh, you know, specifically, what do you see as far as the Smart City Initiative is concerned? Ultimately, I think our companies want to provide uh, consultancy. Uh, they want to be knowledge partners. They want to help build the infrastructure of a modern smart city. You know, when you look around the world, there is no country in the world facing the urbanization uh, challenge and also opportunity that India is facing. The numbers of people that are going to be moving into mm. cities will happen at an unprecedented rate. It already is happening. We've been through this experience in the United States. We've helped. Our companies have brought some of the best technology and best solutions to bear in other parts of the world. And we want to be involved in that conversation here in India. And the president has committed to the prime minister that we would be. 
Now you brought up uh, the municipal bond market, mm. it, which relates to another issue, which is how do you finance yeah. all of these uh, big projects? And, and I think there are some interesting public-private partnership opportunities in the mix. Uh, but this is really an important issue, and I think the ability to raise uh, money for uh, large infrastructure mm. projects is one of these continuing challenges that we have to figure out how to help solve. I know the central government's putting money forward, the states are putting money forward, and now as we get to the larger infrastructure projects, financing those will be a collective challenge we both have to work on. Uh, defense is the other big area of opportunity. Uh, we're still waiting for the final details of the defense procurement policy. Uh, but on the face of it, do you really see uh, U.S. private sector in the defense sector feeling more confident of being able to invest in India to perhaps get into joint ventures in India? We've just seen Boeing do its first joint venture here in India. Do you see that confidence now? You know, I think uh, people are always surprised when I say Parts of the president's helicopter are made right here in India. Parts of the C-130, the workhorse of the Indian and, and U.S. Air Force made right here in India. We have major U.S. defense companies talking about moving production lines right here to support uh, make in India. Even though our defense sales numbers have been uh, really positive over the last five or six years in particular, well over $10 billion, we are looking to move well beyond buyer-seller to a, a joint uh, production, joint research, joint development relationship, which is much more sustainable, brings in technology transfer, brings in skilling, brings in the indigenous manufacturing capability that I think is one of the objectives of, mm. of Make in India and not to become, uh, you know, I think the Prime Minister said it well last year at Aero India when he said, we don't want to be the number one defense importer yeah. of the world. We understand that. But we also think we can be India's best defense partner, mm. and that's the course we're on. I've seen um, the potential in our carrier cooperation, in our fighter cooperation, in our jet engine technology cooperation. Mm. When I think about 21st century security partnerships, I think about the U.S. and India. Commercial agreements on the nuclear side, no forward movement there, despite the fact that there were clarifications that were put out by both sides uh, yeah. to try and get those going. I think we've actually made a lot of progress on the, on the civil nuclear agreement. As you said, it was stalled uh, for quite some time. The uh, President and Prime Minister formed a contact group of legal and nuclear experts in the fall of 2014. That group was able to hammer out a way ahead on, on liability that for suppliers. And in fact, just three days ago, India ratified the supplementary convention on nuclear liability, which would channel liability to operators and not suppliers. So that, are, we, are we closer to an agreement? Plus that, the insurance pool, absolutely. Forward so the to concerns that GE and Westinghouse, et cetera, had, you think that that's a thing of the past or that's been adequately dealt with? I think, uh, look, not every company is in the, in the same position. I would just say we've spent a lot of time on this. The companies have spent a lot of time on this. And uh, civil nuclear power has to be part of the mix going forward to meet the needs of 300 million people that don't have electricity right now and to meet the, the needs of doing so in a, in a low carbon uh, way. So again, I'm, I'm optimistic. You've come in at a time where both sides were trying to sort of re-establish a much more robust relationship right. given the backdrop of what had happened over the last few years. Right. Uh, you've had the president and the prime minister meeting about six times uh, right. over the course of the past year. They've, they've what talked is... on the phone, oh. on their hotline many times, yeah. uh, even it's... just days before the Paris Climate Agreement. Mm -hmm. So what has it been like for you, being in the hot seat quite literally here? Literally in the hot seat. It's, <laughs> it's been uh, a great honor and it's been uh, terrific. And, um, you know, I think our objective is just to make sure we keep up the incredible momentum that was generated by our two heads of state. We, we want to be good partners and that's, that's what this past year and a couple months has been about. And that's what 2016 will be about. And I know we can take it even even uh, higher than we've been in 2015. Ambassador Varma, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank Great. you very much for joining us on thank Team so TV 18. We wish you all the very best with your priorities uh, for 2016, and thanks very much for thank your you. time. Thank you. It's been great. On that note.